Welcome back to day 47 of Everyone You Love is a Molester. Oh, boy. Santa Claus has been outed as a... Oh, Mrs. Claus it. says to investigators that... <sighs> it's just really bad. It's just really bad. It is really bad. Everyone that you love... Well, here, what do you think about the idea of the problematic fave? The problematic fave? Do you go on the internet? Do you know Sometimes. what internet mean? I know what internet means. Uh, there's this idea of the problematical fave, and it came, they came up with it way before this whole scandal thing launched, and it's the idea that... Yeah, man, you're going to like Woody Allen movies, and he married his daughter, or such stepdaughter, whatever. Right. Um, so you just got to get over it. And I never liked the idea of that. I've always been somebody who has very uncomfortably failed, usually, to divorce somebody's personal life from their art. It's hard. Hence the problematical fave. Yeah. I'm not done. Okay. And so, and I don't, so I don't keep track of that stuff, but I'd love to know where that movement's at now because I think it's pretty much shot, isn't it? Yeah, it has to. I hope you didn't like House of Cards. Yeah, no kidding. Somebody does, right? Yes, absolutely. Of course they do. So it's just, it's real problematic now. And I mean, nothing, I don't think anything really earth shattering has happened since the last time we talked about it, but it's, it's, it's my headspace. Yeah. Where's your head at? Um, my head is at that and other things. Yeah, you, well, your two heads can't occupy the same space at the same time. It's physics. It's just physics. Yeah, uh, this is true. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, my head's kind of at. I found out that a friend of mine passed away in a really horrible way, and. That's kind of where my head's been at. Does anybody know where Louis C.K. was? <laughs> it's, it's time to laugh again. I don't think it was Louis C.K. Yeah, it's uh, it's very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. It's um, you know, things are bad. Um, and escapism used to be something that we went to when things are bad, and now escapism is mainstream. So where do you go? And I think maybe that explains hipsters. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> when you used to go like read, you know, read video games or play comic books. It was a weird time <laughs> to get away from adult responsibility. And now a lot of those adults, we're going to talk about it today. A lot of adults spend a lot of time on this kitty book. Got to make a little, it's got to appeal to all the quadrants and we'll get the casting process and all oh, you're fired. And like that's escapism is now work. So wax your mustache or <laughs> build a table or something. And that must be what it is now. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, um, well, if it's possible to escape from this horrible stuff, it's our job. We're driving the train. We're the engineers of that. And Ooh. we're the Just Enough Trope podcast. <laughs> and also uh, amateur uh, steam whistle uh, callers. So I'm your oh, host, Caliban, you. joined as always by my co-host. Hi, I'm Mika Hanna. And we're here to talk about something that is seems dark but there's there's a light a rainbow sparkly uh, edge under it uh the story of the runaways yes which is a tv series on hulu which has premiered i don't even know what the days are thanksgiving or like the beginning of this week it's hulu they're weird yeah and it's based off of a comic book by brian k vaughn and adrian alfana as the artist and we'll be talking about that as well for comic book club so reviewing the first volume the first 18 issues get it they, they want to be adults, they're kids. It's 18 issues. <laughs> we'll talk about whether there's 18 issues worth of content in those comics. But don't give it away. We'll talk about it when we get to Comic Book Club. All right. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, Runaways on Hulu, of course, a review of the pilot. And we're we have an interesting um, sort of conundrum here. Do we talk about the comic first and the pilot second? That seems to be the thing to do. But we'll definitely spoil elements that will appear in the TV series. While we talk about the comic, we won't be able to help doing that. So what do we do? Like talk about the comic, then say here on out spoilers, put some tags in there and then go talk. I guess I just solved the problem. I or, guess or, so. or it would solve it all to talk about the TV show first. Or is that weird? It might be weird. Don't talk about the, the annotation time, before the source material. I don't know. It's hard to say. 
Um, be like watching um, Exodus gods and, and prophets or whatever and be like, hmm. now did you know that this was based on a series of books? Uh, it's called the Pentateuch. Uh, oh, really? Who wrote that? Uh, two authors, actually. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we'll do it my, the first way that I said. Okay. Yeah. Um, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Um, it was pretty good. <laughs> no, I'm not doing a role play with you where you're Mary Todd Lincoln, <laughs> uh, newly widowed. I'm just saying, how's, how are things going otherwise? Um, otherwise, things are going pretty well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, they sound like they're really popping off. Uh, uh, things are uh, good f- for me. Thanks for asking. Uh, I'm, I always love how um, you're interested in my well-being. Um, I am interested. I, things in are getting well-being. pretty hot with the Klingon Christmas Carol, which opens this weekend at the Mounds Theater. I guess I don't know if I've talked about it on this show, but I'll put a quick plug in. I'm directing a Klingon Christmas Carol. It is what you think it is. It's all there on the tin. Uh, is there a tiny little Klingon that's a uh, tiny Tim with a tiny little Batleth? The answer is yes, there is that. <laughs> the tickets are on sale at moundstheater.org. It runs until just before Christmas, basically, all through the month of December. It's a good time. Uh, it has had by all. It's fully in Klingon language with subtitles. There are a lot of in-jokes and references to Star Wars and stuff. But even if you're not a... Or, <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe, maybe Star Wars. Star Star also Trek. Star Trek. Yeah. And even if you're not a Trek fan, it's a still holiday fun for the whole family. So check that out. Why don't you check out this news? Real quick, I wanted to say that Mystery Science Theater, The Return, is the official title of the Netflix series, is coming back. It's getting a second season. All right. No word on when, but it has been announced by Netflix. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, slight spoilers. They kind of killed Jonah at the end of... Uh, I guess that is a big spoiler. It's not oh, slight. wow. Uh, but okay. I mean, you know, it's, it's not in the not too distant future. I'm sure they have things that reattach all kinds of souls back to bodies <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> oh, boy. We'll see if um, I hope Patton, Patton Oswalt comes back. Yeah, I hope so, too. I think he was. I, I can't remember. He either finished all his shooting before his big year or was doing it in the midst of it. OK. I'd have to imagine and probably hope that it was the former yeah speaking of which i just saw his special on netflix oh how was that it was good it was good let's call it mid-period Patton. okay so mid-period Patton is you know he is a pillar of the comedy community he's a legend in his own time and be, as such all of his bits are just explanations of how crazy his life is now right and they aren't any um tightly constructed narratives like they used to be about Dr. Pepper at the Yuck Yucks in Toronto uh, right. you know, or anything like that. Stellador breakfast treats, all that's gone. Now it's just, so my daughter the other day, it's like, all right. <laughs> all so right. not as good. No. Okay. New wife though. So new material, right? Yes. It's time to laugh again. I told you. <laughs> it's the kind of joke that he would love being mad at me about. Uh, anyway, so yeah, like we said, uh, MS23K, looking forward to it. Uh, Justice League. Remember Justice League? Yes. It seems like it was so long ago. Does it? <laughs> it was about six and a half days ago. But anyway, uh, Justice League, uh, the opening scene, which I proposed or posited was solely the work of Joss Whedon, the takeover yes. director on the film, uh, I turned out that I was right. That's exactly what it is. Actor Holt McElhinney, who you might see or we have been seeing recently in Netflix's Mindhunter. Yes. Who I've always been a fan of. And I'm so glad that he has finally found a vehicle because he's always had that real, you know, 50s pinup charm. Not pinup like uh, Vargas, but, you know, just like a guy on the cover of a men's life Weasels are ripping his flesh, you know, type. He's got a real yes. period look. And uh, he fits. He's great on that show. Yes, he is. As is the other guy who is great in a different way. Okay. You know what I mean? It's, How is he great in a different he's way? He's like, I don't know what's going on here. And like also, th- they're playing that thing that you have to play in every serial killer thing where it's like, I get too close to these guys. and Maybe, maybe I can cross over the line myself. <laughs> Played probably to perfection by William Peterson in Manhunter, but just every crappy serial killer thing is like, we don't know about this guy. The guy's catching him. Maybe he's more like them than we think. Sure. And this guy does a good job at that because he's already 
uh, we're talking about Mindhunter on Netflix right now. Uh, he's already, Holden is already um, a little, doo, doo, doo. he's, what am I doing? He's, he's, he's uh, Asperger-y, you know what I mean? Like he sure. has trouble relating to others. He is in- intuitive about emotions, but doesn't show a lot of them. And these are all things that if you told me, oh, he burned like cats when he was eight, I'd be like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. I'm glad he's on our side. You know what I mean? Right. Like, he, but he, he does it without playing it like, oh, interesting. The he, the killer um, t- played with panties. Weird. And then we cut down to his hand, you know, and it's it, a cutaway of his pocket. And he's like, just got some panties in his hand. Oh, stop. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he shows that he sort of identifies with these guys, or maybe he's pursuing them so hard to understand himself, but the narrative doesn't hit you in the face with it like a claw hammer you know and you're being killed by a serial killer that's why i used to murder imagery oh my gosh thoughts none you don't have any um thoughts. i i think you're right about it i mean they certainly want to play the double-edged sword here where he's will he or or won't he do anything himself so Oh, okay. I don't think they, that he will. I don't think that he will necessarily It's all based either, on true stuff. Yeah. Unless the book was about how an FBI agent became the BTK killer. Oh, my gosh. I'm outing the fact I haven't read the book. All right. Well, anyway, waiting for season two on that one. What was the original story? Oh, yeah, that it was um, the opening scene was comedic. So it was kind of goofy. I mean, it's already goofy, but Batman is flipping around and he's joking yeah. with the guy from Weasels Rip My Flesh. And he catches this thing, and Whedon turned it in, and they're like, no, this is going to be serious. We right. can't open our big superhero movie with a joke. There's no way. Right. Yeah, that's never worked. <laughs> I mean, like, what was the opening of Avengers? It's all know. them, you know, you think that, are you saying you're going to step on us? And it's like all this Whedon dialogue. So anyway, they sort of recut it and toned it down to make it like, I need your fear. Like, much less comedic. And this is all part of an interview with, fittingly, Men's Fitness that Holt McKelleny did. <laughs> so <laughs> give me a copy of that. Keep it in my special room <laughs> under my mattress. Um, that's some information about that. Uh, what else? It looks like Neil Gaiman's and Nancy Boys will be turned into a radio drama. Okay. On the BBC. All right. That's cool. It airs in six parts starting on Christmas Day. Oh. Well, that's nice. Kind of have to compete with Doctor Who. A little bit. If I was in Britain, I'd be like, I'm good. I'm good. What about Boxing Day? Yeah. Let's aim for Boxing Day. That would be good. What is Boxing Day? (laughs) It's like the day after Christmas. Okay. They have it in Commonwealth countries, and the idea is you box up all your, uh, or it has become this, you box up all your... I'm telling you what it really is, and I missed a great, this is why I'm not a comedian, a great opportunity to lead you down this primrose path about uh, Jack Dempsey and, <laughs> and just like Muhammad Ali. Uh, you box up all your leftovers and you give it to people that need them. Oh, okay. <sighs> Dumb. Yes, that's what I'm doing. All right. Hey, somebody possibly doesn't know that. Um, so you're on Mika's side. But anyway, come on. <laughs> that's when I want to do it because Doctor Who owns Christmas. Yes, that's true. At least they probably, well, Star Wars owns Christmas, too. Um, speaking of Marvel properties, nice fat segue there. Jude Law has landed the male lead opposite of Brie Larson in Captain Marvel's Mans. Okay. What do you think? Um, could be good. It's getting getting hotter. Getting hotter on that set. Yeah. Um, reaching reaching set fire levels. <laughs> Just cast uh, Chi McBride and Oliver Platt as the hapless scientists oh, who boy. M- screw up and she gets her powers. And that's one where it's like, I hope the, the entire set burns to the ground. Oh, my gosh. It takes all those actors with it. Horrible. Terrible. Awful. But necessary. <laughs> it's like a forest fire. You know, sometimes the forest gets overgrown. New growth comes. Oh, boy. Get rid of the old dead wood. <sighs> it's fine. I mean, isn't he... I guess he's at the level of Marvel movie now, isn't he? Yeah, for he sure. He's so big. Is he not in this sex scandal thing because it was all consensual? Like, you can bang your kid's nanny, uh, but if your kid's nanny was into it, then we're good. Yeah. 
Yeah, I wouldn't let that guy <laughs> take a gondola ride with my girlfriend, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so anyway, it looks like he's going to play Marvell, and so now we know that the story will be what you the, the classic Captain Marvel story. Okay. But set in the 90s. 90s. How is she going to play old? I guess just I keep that know. frowny grandma face and then they'll just put some lines on it. I guess so. Does she have anti-shade powers? Because I'm her <laughs> arch villain. Yeah, that's one that's going to be set in the 90s. Um, it looks like Mendo, Ben Mendelsohn, is probably going to be the main bad guy. Who is who? It doesn't matter. He'll be a Skrull anyway. So he'll just be Skrull face guy. Okay. The green butt chin guys. <laughs> Heaven knows if they'll be green because... The Hulk, well, God knows that fans can only understand one color at a time. So Drax is gray because Hulk is green. Yes. <laughs> and Gamora is green. Barely. Barely. I guess she's a different kind of green. Or maybe people are like, no, bo- boobs. Green boobs, different yes. than green with purple mm, pants. That's true. Yeah. If she puts on a pair of purple pants, though. We're going to lose some our minds. Heads, some finely coiffed head spinning in those L.A. screening rooms. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> I didn't think Ruffalo was in this one. <laughs> he looks good, though. <laughs> Get my couch out. <laughs> I just, nice, nice stifled laugh. Uh, it's Lizzie, uh, speaking of comic book movies, Lizzie Kaplan is joining the cast of the Gambit film, which apparently is still is a real thing that exists. Okay. Still exists. They are planning, planning some sequels out. And there's another one. Lizzie Kaplan has kind of reached the level of, yeah, I'll do a Marvel movie. It's fine. <laughs> it's a movie. It was on TV for like four years. So, Yeah. I th- all the prime cuts are gone now, right? You're Pretty coming much. in and you're getting the... Uh, the, the ground round or, or whatever the, I don't know, my meats, whatever the bad, the, the shoulder. Chuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chuck. Right. <laughs> uh, no, Chuck's a TV show. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, we are supposed to be casting. Aren't we? Look, how many phases are there? That's my first question. I don't know. That leads into my follow up question, are. which is if we're going to bring it to a close and we're not going to do a soft reboot or whatever, then we're, we need new heroes. We need a She-Hulk. We need a, um, I don't know, uh, Captain Marvel. Uh, we need a Tigra. <laughs> well, we're getting down there. We need a Wonder Man, for God's sake, already. Sure. Um, we've got a Squirrel Girl on TV. Yes. If you're Marvel, how do you make decisions like this? I don't know how they make decisions. I agree that Squirrel Girl is definitely more of a TV character, mainly because I think she'll take over the whole thing. And people want to see her, so have them come watch every week uh, in between tampon commercials. Sure. But she's so popular, you think, well, get her, get her to the movies right Yeah, now. exactly. Can you think of anybody else? Um, Cloak and Dagger on Freeform. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, boy. We need a, a D-man, you know? <laughs> All right, look, yeah, Lizzie Kaplan, good luck to you. We need a Martian Manhunter, except that's the wrong, <laughs> the wrong comic book. We series. do need a Martian Manhunter. Yeah, would that have really upset the balance of Justice League that much? No, no, I don't think so. You just bring him in. You do. He's a Martian. Have him be. He's already there. Yeah, he's already there. So there's a guy, like, Bruce is taking care of that. You don't have to, because what is he, flying to Mars or something? How do you even set that up? So, like, Bruce Wayne is going around, he comes on the King Tide. Yeah, he's doing Dr. Fish. <laughs> and he's talking to people, trying to recruit people. And he's got this other guy who's, like, running around. He's like, hey, yeah, check this out. It's like, oh, okay, great, thanks. I'll be in touch. And you're like, who is this guy? Yeah. And then we get into a situation where, I don't know, somebody, more demons come after Batman or something. And it's like, oh, he doesn't have his bat stuff with him. What's he going to do? Yeah, and then suddenly, rawr, this guy turns into a dragon. It's like, oh, it saves him. It's Martian Manhunter, and then Bruce is like, "I told you, taught not to do that in public. A secret weapon. <laughs> He'd just be a side guy. Set him up. This, these DC movies, they don't know how to set anything up. 
No, they Unless don't. Rick and Morty are going to show up in the next Justice League movie. They didn't set anything up. No. They said Dark Side one time. That was last show. Hi, welcome back. You, you've traveled in time. <laughs> to last week. Speaking of Justice League, uh, not doing good. Uh, it is not doing good at the box office. It has fallen from its opening. And um, it is behind Coco. Coco is burning it up this week. Oh, wow. Here's a review of Coco. Yeah. Well, now my time machine won't work. I thought I could take you forward in, in time. Uh, oh, okay. To next week when we've seen Coco. Haven't seen it, heard it's good. Um, but yeah, it is, it's not doing well. Um, it had a, oh boy, I don't know. It's below 70 million. That's what Coco okay. made. Uh, I don't have a definite number. So it's, it's a flop. It has officially flopped. Okay. Well, that's too bad because yeah. I think it was kind of fun for what it was. So was parts of The Amazing Spider-Man. So this is DC, you know, has unlimited money. They're never going to. St- it's like the universal on their monsters. They're just going to keep doing it. And yeah. eventually it'll work. So this is just Spider-Man 3, Amazing Spider-Man 1, Amazing Spider-Man 2. They'll just try again. Yeah. They'll wipe the slate. They'll maybe keep just like, you know, how Judy Dench kept playing M throughout uh, two different bonds because they're like, well, we like Judy Dench. It's working out. Right. Keep um, what's her name around uh, as Wonder Woman. Yeah. And just try again. Yeah. They got that flash point hip pocketed, ready to play the trap card. I think just do something different. If you do flash point, do you do a different flash afterwards? Or is that weird? <laughs> it's like, wow, I ran so fast. My face is different. Yeah. <laughs> my voice my voice is deeper. Uh, and zip. That's the big joke. Um, no, you keep the same guy. I think he's pr- he and Wonder Woman are like the only people that came out of Justice League smelling like roses. Yeah, I think so, too. So I say keep doing that. Did we talk about Joss Whedon before? We talked about him a little bit. Still attached to Batgirl. Okay. That's another movie that, I don't know, might happen. I'm sure it will happen. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. What, <laughs> what would you like to see out of a Batgirl? And how hard will he have to fight to get her shot in the spine? <laughs> Because he loves torturing his female heroes and female wives as well. Um, Not gonna let that go. Yeah, he almost made it. You know what I mean? I feel like maybe people have forgotten, but I feel like he almost made it. If we had found out about all that stuff a month earlier, we would have forgotten around the time like Me Too showed up. Yeah, but now it just didn't. You know, it didn't. The statute of limitations hadn't run out. It didn't. It didn't make it under the wire. Like I feel like now that this is the whole Me Too thing has become a huge issue. We're looking at all people and how they treat women and stuff. And I think he's still, he's still a part of that to yeah. the point where I haven't looked, but I bet if you went on Change dot org, you'd find more than one petition that's like, get him out of there. Yeah, I like bet you're Patty, right. Patty Jenkins do Batgirl. I bet you're <gasps> Ooh, right. That'd be good. Yeah. That would be good. No, I haven't actually, I'm a little embarrassed, I haven't actually read a ton of like, quote unquote, new Batgirl, like post um, 52, Gail Simone, Burnside type stuff. I'm guessing right. it's like, like whoop, 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 kind of funny. I think so. All right. That's not really Patty Jenkins. Well, there's, there's comedy in Wonder Woman. Yeah, there is. Thanks for agreeing. You're welcome. Hashtag you too. At some point in their lives, all young people believe their parents are evil. But what if they really are? That's the concept behind Runaways. The Runaways. No, just Runaways. Yes. The Runaways is a jailbait band from the late 70s. (laughs) We're talking about Runaways, written by Brian K. Vaughn and penciled by, uh, what's that guy's name? Adrian Alfona, who, by the way... Um, I don't know if you recognize his style or, he, or recognize the name, but he was the original artist on, he might still be doing some fill-ins or coming back, on Ms. Marvel, the oh, G. Willow Wilson okay. um, Ms. Marvel launch. And The Runaways is, well, I'm going to have you give us a plot summary or synopsis. You haven't decided which one you're good at yet. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll tell you really fast that it follows the lives of six teenagers, Alex, 
uh, actually six teenagers and or five teenagers and, and one girl who's a preteen, pre-teen. and uh, that acts like a four year old. Uh, yeah. Alex, Gertrude, Carolina, Chase, Molly, and Nico, and their parents are super villains. Yes, um, and they each have improbably a set of two parents. Nobody's divorced. Nobody is a no. step anything, and we'll That's get right. to why that is later on. And tell us about the Runaways. Well, and they well, all let's have. Let's see. There's Lita Four. There's a... tell us about Runaways. They all have one kid, also. Yeah, and that's yeah. It makes sense. Yeah, Runaways. Um, basically, they they're every year they get together. Um, for this one night when their parents supposedly are doing charity work. And they, the kids get together and hang out while their parents are doing this charity work behind doors. Um, and Alex just has discovered a hidden passageway in his house. And so they decide to go and check it out. And through a two-way mirror, they notice... They witness their parents kill a, a young girl, right? As a sacrifice. It's real. They're wearing like robes and they're using like a ceremonial dagger. Yeah, it's real eyes wide shutty. Yes, which I think is a joke that it Brian is. Kavon makes. <laughs> it is a joke that they make. Yes. Please finish the synopsis so I can start tearing this apart. <clears throat> Sorry, I've pretty much finished. The oh, you're synopsis. done. And then yeah. they go to the police. No, they well, run away. They run away. Yes, <laughs> they're runaways. Uh, yes. Every one of yeah, they're super villains basically. Um, and every one of their parents have a thing or a deal. Yes, I think. Um, and I don't know anything about this. So let's just speculate. It's fun. Um, Brian K. Vaughn came up with the concept and it was like, all right, everybody, like, if there's going to be like an evil Justice League or an evil Avengers, then we've got to represent every flavor of the. Um, power set you know category like right. he got his heroes unlimited book out and just started rolling like two ten sided and so there's the evil geniuses and there's the time travelers there's the mutants there's the magicians there's yes. the tech guys and the aliens the aliens that's right the colonists the colonists right yeah we'll get to that in a second yeah um and that's and that's what it is and so the kids all go on the run and have, they have to protect each other yes and of course, it's difficult because their parents are part of this organization. And you get this problem in comics that's been around for a while. First time we've heard of it because it was just right. created by Brian came on uh, called the pride and they're into everything. And so the kids live in L.A., um, the nice part of L.A. They're all, you know, rich. So this is like Brentwood type stuff. Right. And the parents have, you know, have the cops under their thumb and they can yes. control the media and all this stuff. And so, yeah, the kids are have to hide out and figure out what they're going to do with themselves. But they're not just kids. No. Because this is a comic book. The kids themselves discover that they too have powers and abilities beyond the mortal, mortal men. That's true. Or woman. Yes. Or mortal. That woman can die too. <laughs> uh, let's talk about some of those powers. Um, yeah. One of the girls is a mutant. Um, another girl is an alien. Um, she can fly and stuff like that. Yeah. And shoot people. (laughs) Really anybody can shoot people. Yeah. If the last year has taught us anything. Okay. Well, with her powers. Not a political show. Um. (laughs) Powers? I got a bump stock. (laughs) Stop. Um. And then there's another... Magic Girl! Yeah. Question. Is Magic Girl like super gothy? Just checking for a friend. Yes. Okay. Super gothy. The friend is non-hackneyed. Good taste. (laughs) Should we... (laughs) Do we get through them all? And then one girl's got a dinosaur. Doesn't make any sense. So uh, let's give our recommendations and then let's just start tearing this thing up. (laughs) Oop, that's my recommendation. Okay. Um, Don't bother. If you're 13, if you were 13 in 2005, you love this. <laughs> Nowadays, it's not going to do anything for you. If you're an adult, don't bother. If you're a kid, you probably there's you've already got something that would surpass this, I think. Okay. You. Um 
I mean, it's kind of simple, and it's um, in its concept, and I think it's incredibly complex in its concept. You think so? Yeah. How about a thumbs up or thumbs down? Um, I guess I give it a thumbs down. <laughs> wow. Okay. So so sweetly delivered and even handed. You're like, yeah, I, yeah. I really don't like this. Yeah. Well, I I didn't like it overly much. Um, okay, now we're gonna start spoiling things. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about how you didn't like it overly much. Um. It just didn't really fit the bill. Um, Who's your favorite character? Gosh, I don't even know if I have a favorite character. <laughs> okay. uh, I didn't like this either. I didn't like it when I read it, when it became a sensation back in 2004 or five when it came out. I was flabbergasted, but then I thought, well, I guess it makes sense. This is deep in the the Jemis, Bill Jemis era of Marvel when okay. Marvel was transforming itself into like it had trouble. Oh, it's about a young slutty Aunt May and they had you know they were trying all these different things under this president Bill Jemis uh who was pushing them to you know to stop Thor's fighting absorbing man for the millionth time, which in pr- uh, principle is a good idea. Um perfected with the Marvel now kind of era really okay (laughs) but at the time they were just turning out all kinds of stuff and marvel had just learned the value of writing to the trade and decompressing in your storylines and the king of that is brian k vaughn this does not need to be eight you could do this in six issues no problem yeah no problem this entire storyline done all done and the runaways have never boy i think they had an ongoing unlimited for a while i can't remember anyway there's been like two or three sort of different volumes kind of like young avengers like they went for a while but then just stopped and then okay. there's like another young avengers young avengers actually is another example of doing this but more or less getting it right okay especially when um gillen mckelvey steps on my favorite creator gilvin mckelvey um gil mckelvey um but this just doesn't it's way too long it's way too padded it's a 45 year old guy trying to write like he's 16 failing at it the kids all sound the same they're it's he's just like ooh, uh pop culture how about saddam it's dated as hell it, it doesn't dated. work at all which i guess you know daredevil used to like look at the tv and go that bobby kennedy he's something else so i mean you can't help that sometimes but it's just completely dated, and the ki- it just the kids the dialogue's clunky. It goes on forever. It's, he does the Brian K. Vaughn thing where it's like, huh, this conversation's going on for six pages. What surprise twist are you holding for the last splash page? Sure, I get so sick of him telling stories like that. That's why I gave up on Saga. He's limited in somewhat in the pop culture references he can make in Saga. He has to be a little more original. But it's that same thing where right. it's like, why is this scene going on so long? Oh, I know. It should have ended or we should have had some twist 10 pages ago. But that's your hook and bring them back Splash for the next page. time. Yeah. Yeah. Brian K. Vaughn would go on to some success at writing for Lost, which is basically just like the TV version of a Brian K. Vaughn comic book. Yeah, it is. Oh, Juliet, let me tell you about some stuff. Oh, sorry. You're full of crap. Oh, sorry. What's that? The water in the ocean is gone. <laughs> lost <laughs> and so everything in, that he does is like that and it it really wears thin after a while like we're spoiling things so alex is the traitor there's no real yeah um there's no real motivation given i mean i guess he kind of his explanation kind of makes sense but none of his behavior matches it leading up to that point no absolutely I know, I not i believe that that was planned from the beginning but give smart readers something to do also it would be hard to pin anything on him because he spends the, like 10 middle issues just holding a book and a ring and going i haven't figured this out yet yeah that's his only function yes it's stupid that is stupid and then it's like i'm the bad guy well he didn't do anything else so i guess it makes sense um 
Molly is supposed to be 11 and they write her like she's brain damaged. Maybe she's retarded like the kids in the book say. Wow. Maybe she's gay too. Wow. In a in a neg- negative uh, uh, pur- purgatory. Not the word. Purgatorial. Help me with the word. I have no idea what word you're trying to find out. In a, Using it in a disparaging way. Yes. <laughs> Uh, that's a little. That's pretty dated. That it's okay to say that stuff. Yeah, it's not okay. I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling at Brian K. Vaughn. I know you're on. So you can join in. I know. I know you want to yell at him too. Stop using that word, Brian K. Vaughn. <laughs> well, I doesn't do it anymore. <laughs> no, it's okay because Carolina's gay, so that's fine. Stop it. She is. Is she? Yeah. Oh. You know that that 16 year old girl in the year 2005 that named herself Lucy in the Sky. Yeah. It's a real, direct, at least the one kid is literally a vampire who's like 150 years old. So like he's into the I Beatles know. because like he probably saw them at Shea Stadium. Probably. Why would a girl name herself Arsenic and Old Lace? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's just so tone deaf. They're not, that's not going to be in the Hulu show. There's no way. You don't think so? Let's save it for the TV segment. Okay. What was good about this? Oh, here's something else while we're just pounding on it. Uh, Alfana definitely gets better. He gets better. Like I would tell a retarded gay kid. (laughs) Like it gets better. Uh, By the time he gets to Ms. Marvel, he's owned his non-traditional comic style. Mm -hmm. And we get some fun stuff out of him. This is just shamefully bad. I don't like the noses. (laughs) I don't like any of it. And um, I was going to write down the guy's name. There's like a... They, could, they couldn't even make it to 18 because they need like the two or three issue kind of fill in bit where like Cloak and Dagger come to hang out. Yeah. And those are drawn by um, a different person, Takeshi Miyazawa, who I'm not very familiar with, but his stuff is very manga-esque, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, I liked him way better than I liked Alfonso's stuff or Alfonso's stuff. Okay. Suddenly everybody likes their, looks like they're kind of anime and then Cloak and Dagger show up. Yeah. You read that part. I did. You're not reacting, though. I don't remember it being all that different. <laughs> it was super memorable. Yeah, it's. I just think that it's embarrassingly bad. It's not great. And he left comics for a while. I don't know if it's because it was embarrassingly bad, <laughs> bad work. <laughs> he definitely came back with strength. I mean, he was doing uh, Uncanny X-Force, and then he got the um, the Ms. Marvel job. And I love his stuff on Ms. Marvel, but this is just hard to look at. I would agree with you. A lot of it is... Too, you know, the art process is like you pencil and then there's an inker or like a finisher and it's just not finished. This might have been, this was mid 2000s. So computer coloring was definitely established, but it might have been still in the period where they were kind of leaning on like, oh, the colors will save it. You can draw a stick man right. and we'll, you know, put some graded colors on there and it'll look good. It doesn't save No, this. it doesn't look good. I didn't like, okay, why have the vampire kid in there just to stretch it out? Just to stretch it out. Just like the cloak and dagger thing. It it really was unnecessary. It was, it was trying to show, from a story perspective, it's trying to show like how you can have a, char- a foil, a character that's like them, only it's an inversion. He is the bad guy and the parents are right. his parents, but he kind of draws himself in. Um, by playing on that sort of side of them, you know, being mad at their parents in a run of issues that spectacularly fails the Bechtel test, um, I'd have to go back and see if any of this passes. Not that that's how we always rate our comics, but hashtag us too. It's something that we want to look at. Yeah. All the parents are wildly interchangeable. Yes, I would agree with you. I don't know that. who's doing what. I'm glad that, uh, and I think that their design is like, we wear goggles, so you know who we are. Yeah. We're black, so you know who we are. You know what I mean? Yes, it's I just, know what you mean. It's uh, it's sad, and I haven't read anything past you know issue eighteen of this volume. But how interesting if they had personalities and we understood them more than just we're doing this kind of because kind of because we don't have any choice because these ancient gods or aliens or something like that told us they're going to destroy the earth, so at least right. we can like be in control of it or whatever when it gets destroyed. Right. And they have this thing where they're going to... So there's 12 of us, and we have to help them take over the world or something by feeding them teenage girls. Yes. And then when it's all over, 
six of us will get to go, <laughs> which is like, yeah, why? It's so arbitrary. I know. And the one explanation is, you know, I bet Brian K. Vaughn gave himself a downstairs handshake when he came up with this, but the aliens are like, well, it's incentive. We know you'll work really hard to be the best. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, but it's so arbitrary. It is. And if they have all these powers and abilities, why don't they just, how tough are you guys? Maybe they'll just attack you. Plus, it doesn't even, it does kind of work as an incentive, but none of them, not in the way that the gibberum or whatever they're called are thinking. Yeah. Like they, almost all, to to a couple, they, they give their slots to their kids if they intend to. Exactly. And we start to see some cracks in the foundation. See, the pride is just so much more interesting and much more of a wasted opportunity to me. Let's go watch these kids eat chips and hang out in like an abandoned mansion. Right. Or we could watch six teams of supervillains all scheme to like stab each other in the back. Right. No, forget that. That doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if Brian K. Vaughan has done any other kid books, but he shouldn't. No. This was clearly him going, <laughs> Brian K. Vaughan, I can do anything. What's it? You want a, you want a YA title? And to, to be, give him credit, it worked because this yeah. was huge. It sold a lot of books. We are about to talk about a TV show on a streaming network that was made uh, out of it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it worked, but you can't write kids. No. Or little kid. Especially a little Molly's kid. ridiculous as a character. Yeah. She is. But she's got blood coming out of her. Jeez, come on, comic book. Jeez. Out of her. We get it. She's nose. She's, she's, no, it's on her nose. Yeah. Uh, Trump. Uh, we get it. She's, you know, puberty. That's when the mutant thing hits. Got yeah. it. Jeez. Also, Chase, Chase's parents are laughably abusive. Yes. Like we literally meet him on the other end of his dad's fist. Yes. <laughs> but he's a genius super inventor. So it makes everything okay. It's not that it's okay. It's I just like the fact that he can like wear a wife beater and literally be beating his son. At the meantime, he's inventing all this amazing stuff. I know. It's like, yes, that's it. I've cracked the quark code. Smack. <laughs> Give me another beer. That is a comic book in itself. <laughs> You it missed is. your opportunity to tell that story. It's not really a Marvel story, though. Well, and Chase, like, defends his family, too. Like, his parents, he's like, they're practically saints. Yeah, and that, it's like, yeah, but that doesn't... If you can... Okay, here's your chance. Defend that right now. Or did Brian Cave on just lose track of who he was writing? I think maybe Brian Is it Kavon some kind of weird, like, uh, survivor or, you know, prisoner, uh, Stockholm Syndrome type thing or something? It might be. He beats me because he loves me, man. <laughs> The character isn't written like that in any other way. In fact, no. he is super flat and clearly just the <laughs> I'm the dude bro. See, he now he would be a dude bro. Back yeah. then he was just like, Oh dude, I don't care about your rules, man. Exactly. I don't know how to end this. Um Runways. Don't read it. <laughs> Runaways, you have absolutely already read it, but maybe there's... I don't really see it as a comic book. Maybe a TV show. <laughs> Let's talk about Runaways on Hulu, the TV show. Yes. Uh, it is out. Um, <sighs> kind of winging it this week. Uh, it's uh, I don't know how many episodes it's going to be. Um, enough. <laughs> a couple. Yeah. Uh, and it is uh, executive produced, or at least consulting producing, by Brian K. Vaughan. Okay. And also executive produced by Jeff Loeb. There's our lost buddies right there. Oh, there we go. Uh, but that's okay. And uh, it's Josh Schwartz, who you might know um, that name as the guy behind Gossip Girl, uh, I'm going to sneeze, <coughs> I'm a sneeze button, uh, The O.C., Chuck, um... He not like well, he co-created Chuck actually, uh, and then his um, partner is um, somebody Savage. What's her name? Can't remember. I have um, no idea. Stephanie Savage. I knew it was a comic booky type name, and so they are famous for creating these teeny TV shows. Okay. Unlike Brian K. Vaughn, they know. I mean, they are in their mid forties themselves, but they know how to write a kid show or, sure. or write a show about 27 year olds who are supposed to be 17 right and they've got experience with this sort of thing and so that's how we approach 
Runaways, which has got a, like a real cool logo and has definitely been OC'd up the yes. wazoo. Um, maybe that's what this was missing. Maybe. Maybe it's just a bunch of like poorly drawn teenagers who are, you know, t- professing their love for Barney Miller or something like that. <laughs> Sorry, it just doesn't. And then we switch that around. It's like, ooh, lens flare, sunset, palm trees. Oh, walking down the hallway. Indie music. Oh, my goodness. Thick glasses. Maybe it was made for this time. Maybe. What would you think of Runaways, the TV show? I thought it was okay. Um, It starts out completely different from the comic um, with a scene that we don't get any explanation of later. Um, No. I, uh, it's the pilot's written by um, Savage and um, Schwartz. Okay. Which also sounds like a good comic team. It does. And it is not, I mean, we get the sort of, you get the what I for TV it's heavy handed, but it's not the comics thing of like, oh boy, you know every year when we come here and our parents do their thing and we have to sit here and we don't like each other, we sure don't. Like it's not yeah. that like let's get it all done in one splash panel or something like that in the comic, but we do get like I guess I'll never live up to her, and she yeah. runs out and she knocks her sister, her dead sister's trophy over, and it breaks, and the I mother's know. resentful, and it's like all right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you guys did create the OC, but <laughs> all right. But honestly, you know, is is in terms of um, being overplayed or whatever. Uh, I thought it was good. Yeah. I almost I was watching it. And I was like, I hate the source material, and I might watch this show. Yeah, not now. I got way too much stuff to do now. But I'll definitely loop back around, you know, when they hit the mid-season break or after the first season, you know, is on, uh, well, it's never going to be, it's a Hulu, it's never going to be on Netflix. But when, once it's, uh, you know, sort of somewhat easily available to watch digitally, I might come back and watch this. Okay. Not, not agree. Um, It's got a dinosaur. It does have a dinosaur. <laughs> they made a lot of smart, you tell me if you agree after I tell you how great it is. They made a lot of smart decisions. Um, consulting producer is one. Uh, <laughs> it's got, if you took all the powers away and in the first hour, which is all we're really reviewing here, um, you don't really see hardly any powers yeah. and there are powers. It doesn't give you a big, oh, no, oh my God, like this little girl is super strong and she's like, huh? And she goes home and tries to push her dad's <laughs> VW van around and yeah. she's like, huh, cool. <laughs> or like one character <laughs> is at a party and she starts hallucinating. She thinks and sees like all these colors and that's her powers manifesting, which she kind of realizes um, when she, you know, she's given this drug and I just thought it was like, that's a good swap out type thing because she takes the drug and she, she starts seeing colors. So I was like, okay, I got lucent scarlet diamonds. I got it. Yeah. We kind of know, I mean, if we've read the comic or we just know this is a superhero show, we know there's something more to it. And so we wonder what she's thinking. She passes out. Later on, she wakes up and we see her throw the drug away. So we know, now we know that she didn't take the drug. Yeah. And she has to wonder if something's going on with her. And as the, as the, yes. as the show continues, we keep learning more information about how the characters see what's going on. That's good storytelling. Yes. Um, they completely eliminate <laughs> Marvel politics has to rear its ugly head. They completely eliminate um, the Hayes couple. Yes. The genetic researchers who are mutants because no mutants. That was easy. Yeah. How do we streamline this show? I know. <laughs> we just let Ike Perlmutter tell us that we can't have one of the couples. <laughs> so now Molly is older. She's probably yeah. 14, 15. Yeah. Uh, you know, freshman, sophomore. And she is adopted. By the uh, Yorks family or yeah. Hernandez or whatever they're called in the, in the show. The Yorks family. Yeah. Gertrude's my favorite character. She's probably She's mine awesome. too. <laughs> she, and it's great because the character that is the totally, total stick in the mud, uh, we're, we're not supposed to like this character, the author doesn't like this character, in the hands of good writers becomes a character who we are supposed to you know, be annoyed by, but yet is so winningly portrayed and so clever that you immediately... She's she's the purple haired Barb. Like I never yeah. got Barb because I we just didn't have enough screen time. There's nothing to get. But That's true. She's like now I get the Barb thing because I'm like I love this chick. Yeah, 
I would agree with that. And she's got a thing for Chase. Yeah. And Chase has a thing for Carolina. And they're dropping very subtle hints that Carolina is part of her rebellion is going to be realizing that she's gay and she's going to follow that. Um, this is Hulu, right? They could do whatever they want. Yeah, they can do it. Um, all the ages vary wildly. None of these kids are are the ages they're supposed to be. No. Age, Chase looks like he's 30. Yeah. <laughs> he looks like he owns that house that the party was at. <laughs> hey, guys, careful. <laughs> you know, it's still an escrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, otherwise, I thought um, the girl that played Molly was um, really good. Um, the girl that plays Carolina's fine. She's just a blonde chick. Yeah. We'll see if she's got anything else in the tank. I don't know if Alex, the character is weird or the actor is weird. There's something or weird. They're, or they're preparing for what's going to come later in the story. And we're in spoiler-free territory right now. Oh, I just spoiled that Carolina's gay, I guess. But because um, we're back just talking about the TV show. Um, <laughs> didn't like Nico. No. Didn't like the character. Didn't I think it's the actress's fault. I didn't really like her portrayal. I think they missed the boat on that one. Mostly because I think the idea of gothed out uh, Asian chick... <laughs> is like died in the 90s and was kept on life support into 2005. Yeah. And so out of all the reinventions of the characters, which is like Chase was always kind of jockey and the the, the child of like brilliant inventors. Um, let's just go the whole way. And he's now he's, like, he's on the football team. Right. And he's what comes with that? Popular. Right. Because sure, your parents could be super genius um white trash hillbillies and beat the crap out of you while inventing rocket gloves or something like that. Sure. But you're not going to be on the football team. No. Uh, so they've kind of just sold out to that. That's part of the OC, you know, Malibu kind of setting. Um, but yeah, I just, they didn't find a way to update Nico much. They Unless she's doing like a retro neo post owning it kind of thing. You know what I mean? I thought that maybe she's dresses up like a geisha as kind of an FU to be like a self-reflexive, taking it back kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of felt like she's dressed like that, kind of like an FU to her parents. Right. Like, she's mad about her sister's death. Yeah. They've added a sister, which used to be friends with all the runaways. Yes. Um, which I think is just, it's fine. I mean, when you think about it in the comic, uh, we're all here just to see our parents kill somebody. Like, that's why they're there. Every year we do this, I say in this expository dialogue. Right. And so TV writers came in and went, oh, you've got to have a thing. This has right. to be a coming back together. You know, We have to imply that there was a history here before. And we'll find out later in the show that she was one of the victims or something like that. There, there will definitely be, that's a hook to something. Yeah. But, at least it's, but it is something. It isn't just, this pizza's terrible. Let's go watch a death. Yeah. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could help it or hurt it at the same time. So anyway, um, hopefully better things will happen for her. Yeah. Not impressed right now. No. They didn't really give her a whole lot to do, though. Well, she carries a lot of the emotional weight of this first episode. Like, it was her sister. I suppose. Her sister really feel, you know, what the characters feel about this kind of through her. And, yeah, I don't know. It's like somebody else wrote her stuff. Her material is just not that great. No. It's not. Hoping for better things. Uh, all the parents are awesome. <laughs> I want to watch the show about the parents. I don't care. Um, I watched a little Gossip Girl. I like the fact on Gossip Girl that the parents had storylines uh, and the kids did as well. And I'm not saying they're any good necessarily, but I hope that we keep following the parents. And I hope so too. They did not do the thing where, you know, they're so nice. Gertrude's parents are making granola some tempest snacks for everybody yeah and, you know and like they're gonna pull the rug out and they're like they're made from virgin blood or something we don't know that they're really any different than they are they just happen to be working for evil aliens that live under the sea right so i hope that we continue to follow the parents and we get into some fun stuff with them i hope so too because all we did was cut out the dumb mutant ones we've still got time travelers oh they would be the time travelers wouldn't they yeah Ooh. Oh, man, I'm going to watch this show, aren't I? <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, we'll see. We see James Marsters as the, they went in the other direction. The, the TV people went, 
No, he's not a wife beater living in a rocket powered trailer park. He's a CEO, like, you know, genius. He's Tony Stark. Yes. What if Tony Stark beat his kid? That's the premise. Yes. And I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's where's that show? <laughs> watch it right now. So, anyway, re re wrap up, double wrap up. So let's um, talk about this property just to justify talking about it at all. Like, what do you think about the runaways? No, Runaways. I think it's, I mean, it's got potential. Um, it certainly does. Made a lot of money from Marvel. Yeah. It It has a good concept, I think. Um, it just doesn't always um, execute it well. Like, like with the comic, there is a bunch of filler. Yeah. And I'm hoping with the TV show that they don't have like a bunch of filler as yeah, well. Yeah, I think the TV show and the people, the very smart people who are behind it, um, realize that yeah, the, uh, here's a premise. Here's a question that's asked. Everybody thinks their parents are evil. What if your parents actually were? The comic was the answer is you become superheroes. Right. End of conversation. And on the TV show, it's well, hold on, it's is going to be this is going to be complicated. Like, how do you, you know, what do you do? Where do you go? What do the parents do? You know, it's more like what happens when a bunch of kids who have, you know, kind of cush, they all live in huge houses, like cushy lives, um, reach a point with their parents where a line is crossed where we we can't go back. No amount of pancakes is going to take care of what this is. And in a family drama, it would be abuse or it would be, you know, like... I'm doing drugs or something like that. Right. But in this case, it's just, oh, no, they murdered a girl while you guys are watched. And you also have a dinosaur. Yes. And so that's one of the things I really liked about how matter of factly they introduced a lot of the elements because it's a smart public. We are watching this. Nobody tuned into this going, huh, by the creators of the OC, you say. Nobody did that. Everybody right. came here knowing what this is, so let's just take that for granted. Yeah, um, smart, written, smartly written, um, well shot. Um, there's a just by the nature of the setting and the premise, there are a lot of domestic scenes, and they didn't crawl in a lot of ways that domestic setup scenes on shows like this often do. When they opened with kids playing a video game dad's like hey hey come on let's eat breakfast and he goes down and he's acting sullen and the parents are like well i don't know why he won't eat his breakfast and you're like oh boy this kind of scene and it didn't really come off that way no the actors are doing a good job the dialogue is is working in their favor and so far so good yeah and of course that's it's real so weird to rate the show on this because this is the only time we'll see this (laughs) unless there's flashbacks yeah this is the only they've got to get it right now the way that they deal with their parents before we know about all this stuff. Because once the guys, the big heads and the six fingers come out. Right. It's the end of that. That's true. What'd you think about the, um, this is a, this is definitely a TV writer thing, but they're like, no, no, her parents are actors. Not good enough. Um, they run a cult, uh, like a Scientology esque cult yes. in LA. What'd yes. What'd you think about that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know why they had to change it. Because they had to. Actors is boring. Apparently, their actors is boring, and also, they had to fit the bracelet in. How many seconds, down to the nanosecond, did Brian K. Vaughn spend on those in, uh, origins? They're actors. They're just both actors. They're extremely married. Uh, they're extremely married. They're extremely <laughs> famous married actors. Yeah. With, uh, I would presume, no past. What do they do on A and E? Yeah. <laughs> they came from nowhere. Uh, there's <laughs> walked out of a cornfield one day and. And then, of course, That's the black characters, point. what did they do before they made all that money? They were robbers and stuff like Holding that. Holding their guns sideways. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice, Brian K. Vaughan. Consulting producer. Guessing the phone didn't ring too much. <laughs> all right, I'm done. I'm done digging on him. So you would say watch it I'd or say check swatch it, out. it? That's my new thing. Check it out. <laughs> Worth getting Hulu for? Um, That's the real test, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> uh, what, what what would you pair it with? The Wrong Mans? I don't even know what's on Hulu. I don't know what's on Hulu either. 
Uh, reruns of Cheers. <laughs> I'm guessing. Uh, which, I don't know, that might be a good thing. Yeah. Or reruns of Frasier, I guess, if you're into that. Sure. Yeah, I'd say watch it uh, as well, and I will definitely, probably be watching it later. So maybe an update on it sometime next year. All right. We forgot to talk about what we're talking about next time for Comic Book Club, and I just realized this is like literally... It you know the the vortex is passing over Baton Rouge right now, and it's the rain has stopped. You can hear birds chirping, right? Yeah. And all around you is like destruction. Um, just before Christmas hits, we're literally in the eye of the storm. Before we are attached to a million things, so we reach one of those weird sure. spots where we can actually pick what we want to read. Sure. And we've got some time in our hands. Yeah. So I think we should go big. Okay. I should go big. And we just did Marvel. So let's go back to DC. And I want to read. We just did 18 issues. Yes. Well, like six issues and then a lot of waiting around. And oh my God. <laughs> my favorite one was like the big surprises. They're just like talking and they're like, huh, well, I don't know about that. It's like, I'll tell you who knows. Oh, we're the cops. We found you. Yeah. That's your surprise? First yes. of all, how the hell did they get in there with 50 riot cops and nobody heard anything? I and know. And second of all, some guy that we're not scared of, who we know is just going to get shot in the face by the pride in a couple <laughs> issues or a couple panels, is like, we got you now. Yeah. What have you got? They have a velociraptor. You I have know. nothing. Exactly. Oh, no. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> Said I was done. Uh, I want to read The Seven Soldiers of Victory. Okay. Since we're talking about weird team ups, and um, yeah, that's what this is, and it's going to take us uh, take us on a ride. We haven't read this before, have we? I don't think so. Have we? I don't remember. It must have been great. Do, do you know the Bulleteer? No. Do you know? I know you know Zatanna. Do you yes. know the Guardian? No. You're going to know. Okay. Do you know Clary and the Witch Boy? No. All right, we're back. All right, so <laughs> Seven Soldiers of Victory. What? Okay, it's Grant Morrison. Okay. So hard as a rock. And I think it was called an anti-series. I'll definitely reread my, um, I'll bone up on the surrounding literature before uh, we talk about it, but it's like an anti-series. This is back probably about the same time that Runaways was coming out. Marvel's putting out Runaways. DC's putting this out. Uh, where they're letting, you know, there's one guy running the store, and it's Grant Morrison. And he wanted to make a series that involved a team of seven heroes who never met. Okay. They are a super team that has never been in the same room together. Okay. And what it is, is it is seven series is of four issues apiece. Okay. And the collection that we'll be reading it out of has them in order. Basically, they came out, and if you read them in publishing order, each one of them makes sense on its own, more or less. Okay. Um, but if you read them in publishing order that they came out, it tells this story that sort of loops around through these seven different narratives in a this gesture doesn't make any noise on the air uh, in a Grant Morrison way. And yeah, tells this kind of intense story. And it does the usual Grant Morrison breaking it down. If this if this is the best, if this is Brian K. Vaughn's commentary on comic books, I feel really bad for him. Okay. Because he clearly doesn't think much about comic books. But every, nearly everything that Grant Morrison does is a commentary on comic books. But this is like an uber commentary on specific concepts of superheroes, on the idea of a team book, what that is, on the idea of a series, okay, and how that comes together. And also he's doing a thing that DC always does where they go, um, Blue Beetle's not a white guy. He's a Hispanic teenager now because, I don't know, he just felt like spinning the wheel, which is all well and good. But he, each one of these characters is connected to an earlier character because the Seven Soldiers of Victory, we're doing the show now. So yeah, until the time machine came back, all you had to do is wait. Um, <laughs> uh, each one of the characters that are represented are, are all part of this old team from the 40s called the Seven Soldiers of Victory. These are all sort of iterative, like DC-ish, you know, bulletier two type characters, but yet relate okay. to the earlier characters in a special way. Okay. 
sounds fascinating. Explosion. It is. And we're going to read it next time. I think it's now available in the latest printing. I think it's available in two volumes. This won't really make a difference for anybody who's following along at home, but we'll be reading it from, I think it's original collected printing, which is in four volumes. Okay. And yeah, so there you go. I would uh, encourage readers to uh, read along uh, if you want to, I mean, you really ought to, because if if you just tune in and hear us talking about it, it's going to be gobbledygook. It's not going to make any sense. We'll try to make it as cool as we can. And that's about it. Uh, that wrapped up the Runaways, Comic No, TV Yes, and we're reading Seven Soldiers of Victory next time on Comic Book Club. All right, that's the show. Short and sweet. Yes. Like, I like my Gertrude's. <laughs> no, like uh, short and sour. <laughs> nobody ever said. Well, that was short and sour. No, nobody ever says that. Or long and sweet, like a candy cane. <laughs> or a red vine. Um, I had a red vine today. Did you? Red vines. I feel. Is it a territorial thing? Like pop and soda. <laughs> I feel like there were no red vines when I was growing up. We had Twizzlers. Yeah. And we had like the the rope the long ones, licorice like rope, like the fifty foot long like yep. licorice rope. We didn't have like the brand red vines because they're they're lighter. They they're kind of have they're whipped or something like that. Yeah, and then they have like a hole down the middle. Yep, and it's like I never liked Twizzlers because there's a lot of matter there. You're really kind of chewing through Twizzlers sometimes. Yeah, that's the red true. vines are you know a little delightful. Okay, so thumbs up on red vines. Yes, and with Mr. Pibb. Crazy delicious. Speaking of things from the mid 2000s. Uh, if you want to hear all of our jokes from the mid 2000s, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Search for Just Enough Trope. We're also still out there, We're still pinning it, still gramming it. I got your pins on your instas and your grams on your mommies, on your, your pennies on your grammies. We got all those things. And it's at Just Enough Trope, one word all together. We're also on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, all the old familiar places. If you go to those places and subscribe to us, it'd be the best way for you to get the show. Also, if you leave us a review, we would appreciate it as well because we love hearing from the fans and hearing how you think we're doing and getting suggestions for what to do in the future. Love to hear about that. And also give us a rating while you're there. Really one of the most important things you can do if you like the show and you want to support it, if you give us a rating, we move up in the ranks. Everybody knows we're doing a good job, and that way we get exposed to more people, and everybody can get what they want. So give us five sets of parents. I'd ask for sixth, but we but don't own the rights to them. That's right. No mutants. So we can't have a sixth set of parents. Probably probably should have got rid of some of the kids, too. <laughs> Just streamline it a little bit. I bet some executive was like, does it have to be six kids? <laughs> I don't want to go digging through the headshot bin or maybe i do <laughs> they're underage they're underage harvey it's not gonna Stop. work terrible let's avoid that and just do five stars instead just a reminder we are reading seven soldiers of victory for our next show our next comic book club it is very special and it's pretty long so that'll probably be most of the show so join us next week for a talk about that and a talk about the wonderful world of Grant Morrison in general. And until then, we're signing off. I'm your host, Caliban. I'm your co-host, Mikan Hanna. Keep the geek fires burning. <laughs> <laughs>